catch a can if you can. We are sailing to the catch a can. We've been sailing all, all evening, all morning. I think it's about nine o'clock. But we come sailing up the pass and there's some cruise ships in front of us. And the cruise ship kind of next us here. We're gonna go into that dock right there. We're gonna parallel park this bad boy. <laughs> yeah, so we're cruising into town here. Getting ready to dock and I think we'll get off the boat. Oh, I don't know, 10, 11 o'clock or so. I don't know, somewhere in there. Anyways, we've got a couple things to do. We're gonna go see the Saxon village, check some things out. This is kind of a big spread out town. It, it stretches way up the, way up the inlet that way and up into the hills. The air's pretty snappy today. It's supposed to rain all day, so we're gonna dress for wet weather. Dress for the cold and uh, lay her up. Okay guys, so we were watching them tie the ship up, right? Well, here we go. These are those blue ropes we were talking about. I was showing you guys. Yeah, that's how they're tied on. See there, they got a loop guided through the ship. Then they've got them two more points up here tied to the dock. And that's just on the front. So this three different lines tied on the front. They got the same thing down on the other end, but that's how they tied up. That's what we were watching the video of this morning. And they were throwing the lines. Holland America, that's our ship, man. So uh, my room's right up there somewhere. Even with the navigation deck, about that far. We're having a great time. We're really having a great time. And I got sidetracked here. Looking at the ship and I've lost track of my wife and it's my fault, so. Uh, <laughs> I don't know where she went, but I'm gonna try to find her. If she's smart, she's in the shelter here waiting for me. And she's probably walking on the road going, where the hell did he go? I don't know where she went. I had to go videotape that. Uh, I had to get a shot of that for you. I'll talk to you in a minute. So we're here in Ketchikan, and uh, we did a little shopping down the, here. And uh, you can't get a good view of that out there. It's raining, and so we're carrying on umbrella. And uh, I bought a new jacket just to just to get an extra layer on and to uh, a little more waterproofing. Uh, I've got a I've got a slicker with me. <clears throat> but my slicker doesn't do much for the temperature, so um, we'll be all right. But uh, we've got about an hour before our tour, and it's raining out here, and these people are standing out. I got a bad feeling we're going to get wet today. But they got several different lines of those duck tours. Um, uh, that'd be kind of fun, I think, but um, I guess there's a high percentage of likelihood that you're going to get wet on that. But we're getting wet anyways. <laughs> so anyways, we're going to we'll hang out here and try to stay dry until we can uh, catch, our, uh, catch our ride. I got a feeling we're going to get rained on quite a bit today, and it's cold. It's right at 50 probably i'd be surprised if it's over that and it's a little windy so we're having a good day so we're inside saxman native lodge we're gonna be seeing a performance here but the work in here is impressive 
very, uh, boy, those are big timbers. Beautiful. And it's very comfortable. I mean, we've got wood floors. So there's a fire pit in the center right there. And we have uh, totems on all four corner posts. They are very cool. Very cool to see. We're glad to be here. <laughs>
to stop filming the last dance they did was a sacred dance they wouldn't allow us to film it and uh, they were calling down fire and salmon from heaven and stuff if you want to see the rest but you have to come to Alaska there's a totem over there this is the lodge that we were in this is the work on the front of it. We're gonna have to hurry down the hill. We're gonna miss out on the rest of it. But let's go on down the hill. I'm sure there'll be some other things we want to look at. But I wanted to get a shot of these. This lodge, clan, house, with the uh, totem. Very cool totems. Yeah, it's a little cold and rainy, uh, but we're enjoying it. I'm fascinated by the culture and by the artistic nature and Some of them are tall. I'll have to get up close to them. They're so intricate. So many different symbols. Each one has a different meaning. The order that they're in has a meaning. Anyways, we're going to get down here and see what, what they got to tell us. Not sure who that guy is, but he's not happy. <laughs> so 
that's William Seward. Helped arrange and conduct a purchase of Alaska. And uh, we have the potlatch hat on his head, and there's rings on it. And each ring represents each potlatch that he would throw. There's four rings. So during a potlatch, they give you, give you gifts, and years time, you're supposed to reciprocate that and give greater or equal value of gifts back. But he did not know this. So once all the potlatches were done, he put all, all his gifts on a ship and sailed down to the lower 48. And the reason why his ears, nose, and mouth is painted red, it is a sign of stinginess because he never returned the favor. <laughs> and a couple years ago, his relatives came here and they asked how much would it be to take down this pole? So they did the calculation. They said it would be about 1.2. <laughs> so I'm going to move on to this next one here in the middle. It is a story poem. It is a story about Koch. Now, Koch was the Hercules type of figure of the village. He did most of the hunting and fishing. One day when he was out hunting, he followed the bear into the cave. The bear ended up knocking Koch on conscience. And when he woke up, the she bear, the she bear was the safe keeper. And she turned herself into beautiful woman she's ever seen about. There's the wild. They ended up having three cubs. The three cubs falling down that pole. One day when he was out hunting, he ended up uh, running into his old brother from his old village. And they were so surprised to see him because they thought he had died. He started a new life. So they asked Koss if uh, they could if he could help hunt for his old village because it's come winter time. So he went back to his new family and he asked the she bear, his new wife, if he could help. She said yes on one deal. Never lay your eyes on your former wife. And when he went on his normal path, out popped his old wife. So Abraham Lincoln. a mystery.
<clears throat> okay. So we're going to the carving center now. Somebody's going to have a hard time getting back on the ship. See. We'll have to read that later. Now we're in the carving center. Some of the tools that they use for the carving. Very uh, strong smell of cedar in here. There's a hole out here that I don't know what they've been working on. Or it's an old hole, or I don't know. I don't know the story on it, but it's, it's, a, it's pretty cool what they can do with these totems. Working on there. So there's the, without all the people standing in it, the totem park, and uh, that is, it's really spectacular. It's really cool. I don't know. You guys think or not? It's cool stuff. We're gonna go in the gift shop. Sat down. Well, we can't see what he's doing, but he's making. Smells like cedar, but I think they carved Sitka spruce. We'll find out in a minute. I'm not sure. That's what I think. This gentleman's going to tell us about it. <clears throat> All right. So, good afternoon. My name is Arnold. I am Haida. I belong to the Evil Clan. And I would like to welcome you guys to the Edwin C. DeWitt Carving Center, which was built in 1989 for the local carvers to place to practice their craft. Today here we have a Haida carver named Norman Nat Hunt Jr. If you'd like to see some of Norman's artwork, he has a black portfolio right over there. And then we'd also normally have a Plinket master carver named Nathan Jackson, who has artwork all over the world. Third of the bark, the reason why I only say one third is if they took any more off, it would end up filling the tree, which they do not want. They want it to grow back for many future generations to use as well. What they use it for, is such as hats, baskets, headbands, cedar rope, sleeping mats, anything that the village really needed. Second use for red cedar is actually for the tree itself, which we use for our much larger projects. For red cedar, such as totem yellow bowls. cedar, and this red one right here and this one as well are both made out of red cedar, which we also use for dugout canoes, panels, and totem poles. Second type of wood that I mentioned, yellow cedar, is much tighter grain wood and shows better detail, which we use for dancing masks, dancing hats, rattles, paddles, and an interesting piece of art 
known as the Bedlam Box. The reason why I call it interesting is because the Bedlam Box is only made out of three pieces, which is the bottom, the middle four sides, and the top. And how they make the middle is a carpal will notch it in three different places and then steam bed it onto itself to get something just like this. This one right here is being held together by some wooden dowels and a little bit of Gorilla Glue, but I never told you that. <laughs> Here's another type of bedwood box, and they will take crushed up clamshells, halibut slime, and use spruce root to hold it all together. Third type of wood that I mentioned, red alder, is what they use for their tool handles. A carver would go out to the woods, find a nice 45 degree angle branch, custom fit it to their hand, strap a blade onto it, to get something just like this. This one right here is called the elbow ads, because the elbow like shape. By chance, did any of you guys get to fill the walls, benches, or even totems of the clam house? Because this tool was used to get that nice and touch. And before we had any metals, we used whalebone, beaver teeth, deer antler, jasper, obsidian, and most commonly found jade, which we get from the jade deposit up in the Juno area. The second type of tool that they use is this one right here, which is called the lip ads. The reason why it's called the lip ads is because lip on either side. This one's used in the middle stages of the project just to guide the blade, get that nice rough general shape that the carver would like. Third type of tool that they use is this one right here, which is called the ship ads. Ship ads is similar to lip ads, just on a larger scale, and has more of a modern axe handle. They use this one to haul the back of the totem pole and the inside of a dugout canoe. And they guys are probably wondering how they raise the totem pole. Well, they build an A-frame, dig a hole six to eight feet in the ground, put a creosote log or nowadays a metal pole, and then they would hoist the totem pole up to the beat of the drum, and off to the side would be the head carver or the carver dancing to the beat of the drum, just like in the diagram behind me. And you guys may be wondering about the paints. We use charcoal and coal when it's more red and available. Also used copper oxide, iron oxide, and it was actually the women of the village's job to make the paint. How they do that, they take the minerals, grind it into a nice fine powder, grab a handful of salmon eggs, put it in their mouth, mix it with their saliva, then spit it back into the bowl with clenched teeth, so that no egg shows the pulp into the paint. <laughs> But nowadays, for some odd reason, they don't do that anymore. <laughs> so that forces local carvers to go out to the local hardware store and get their own custom-made paint. And our common question we get is how fast can a carver get a pole done? A carver could get a foot to a foot and a half done per week, but this all depends on how much detail is going into the pole, how many people are working on it, the size of the pole, and what other projects the carver has going on as well. For example, Nathan Jackson is currently working on this pole, and he could have two to three other projects going on as well. Then Norman Natcock Jr. is currently working on this one, and then this is what it will look like when it is all finished, and it is going to a private buyer in Idaho. Another common question we get is who buys total poles? Well, there's schools, libraries, airports, museums, the cruise line, and then we have private buyers such as yourselves. Another common question we get is how much do they cost? Well, a beginning carver can charge from $500 to $1,000 per foot. A more well-known carver can charge from $2,000 to $3,000 per foot. And a master carver, such as Nathan, can charge $5,000 or more per foot. But do keep in mind these are not exact numbers. These are just estimates. The real number is lie between the carver and the buyer. Now, with that being said, who wants a totem pole today? <laughs> Woo! <laughs> We got, we got business cards right over there and over here as well. So, is there any questions? Do they know the story that they're going to try and tell as they're carving it? Or? So this one is, there's no story behind it. So for a totem pole, in order for a totem pole to go through, it has to remain in our traditional boundaries in order for it to. So for example, it has to be some of the animals that live around here. So for example, there's an eagle up at the top, there's going to be a bear here at the bottom, and then a salmon holding a bear holding a salmon because the gentleman's name that commissioned it, his last name is Medved, which means bear. So he has a bear here at the bottom, and then an eagle up at the top to, what was it for the eagle? Yeah. 
Something that stays in my tradition, and we're both happy. Mm -hmm. Yes. Cool story, so. Yeah. So, for example, uh, last year, Nathan Jackson made, uh, made a poll with Norman Nathalong Jr. and Christian Dalton, which is this poll right here, and what is called the Wush Eton poll, and it was raised up on the Juno docks eight weeks ago as of today. So they apprenticed under Nathan to make this totem poll, and then here is a drawing for it, and it was on an inch to foot scale, so every inch on this piece of paper is a foot on this totem pole. Wow. And then Nathan has a son named Stephen. And when Stephen was 14, Nathan gave him the option to either work for him or for McDonald's. And I believe Stephen made the better choice because Stephen made a totem pole in our private room back there. And it took them also about a year or so to make. This is what the totem pole looks like that Stephen made. Wow. And this one is also up on the Juno docks, which was raised eight weeks ago as well. Mm -hmm. Amazing. Amazing. Any other questions? So that one all does vary on the size of the pole, how much detail go into it, and how many people are working on it. But for this one right here, he has a deadline of October 1st. Uh, but another example, uh, Nathan Jackson, he's been carving for 60 years, and he is 84. He said back in the 60s, he worked on a 7-foot totem pole, and he got that one done in a week. Wow. That's pretty good. Yeah. Oh, wow. wow. And then the Clinkett Master Carver, Nathan Jackson, is right here. And a little interesting fact, Nathan Jackson right here was declared a national treasure as well. Glad you could join us. What did he spray? Water. Alaska. <laughs> Just to make it easier on the tools uh, to carve. Okay. All right. So, one of the things he was talking about was uh, the color patterns um, they use in their newer poles. They'll use a modern paint, but they're sticking to traditional colors. The turquoise, the black, the white, and the red. And apparently in this case, this one's got yellow. But their colors came from the pigments they could pull out of the soil, out of the land. So, <clears throat> so that's what they were doing. So that's pretty cool. So he said, if you see something with, you know, vivid colors that you don't see, it's uh it's either not native clinkets carving it or it uh didn't come from here <laughs> uh could have been repainted but uh anyways that was the clinket uh saxon village of the beaver clan it's pretty cool i could stay a little longer even but we gotta go we gotta get on a bus and go and it's starting to rain again or still <laughs> well we're safe and sound and dry back on board ship we're gonna go get a bite to eat yep. thanks for watching the uh, saxman village and totem park uh, hope you had as much fun there as we did talk to you later